trauma, gifted, and anxious. Greetings, friends. You will see that I have my good friend, Eric Windhurst, with me from Canada. Uh, he's been on the show before, as you know, and I asked him to come back for a specific topic. Trauma, being gifted and intensely sensitive, and how that feeds into what we would call anxiety or just being anxious in the world. This is a very big topic. We're going to cover as much as we can within reason, and I already have goosebumps because I think it's it's profound, and a lot of people aren't talking about some of the things that are important to both Eric and I. So, Eric, welcome to Someone Gets Me for the Second Time. Yeah, <laughs> thanks so thanks for having me, Diane. Yeah, it's really nice to see you again, and uh, of course, to hear your voice. So, thanks uh, for having me. You're welcome. I'm so happy you're here. And I want to start out with how you define trauma and like as you were saying a little while ago a little t traumas like get let's let's put a foundation a context to the rest of this conversation sure yeah so i would yeah i mean trauma can be defined in uh, a lot of different ways i would define trauma as any event that we experience as a person uh, it's a very subjective thing that's the first the first thing that's really important to remember trauma is a subjective experience so two people going through the same experience one might come away with trauma, one might not be traumatized, depending on their interpretation of events, their nervous system, their sensitivities, their intensities, things like that. So trauma is when we go through something which is so overwhelming that we can't fully contain the experience. We can't fully contain and remain whole through that experience. So what I kind of sense what happens is that we little pieces of ourselves can kind of uh, get cut off. We kind of become a little bit fragmented um, because it was just too much to handle. We can't make sense of it. We don't know what to do. And so, so part of us kind of goes, goes away uh, in certain traditions. That's called soul loss. Um, you could also just talk about it as a kind of a fragmentation and the results of trauma uh, vary from person to person. Um, but it's, you know, hypervigilance, it's anxiety, it can be depression, uh, it can be avoiding certain situations. There's so many different effects that trauma can have on people. And sometimes, uh, because we're living in a world that is highly dysfunctional, uh, we live in a dysfunctional society. If you think about the issues like the climate crisis, uh, you think about the increasing kind of separation between different groups of people. You think about dysfunctional educational systems. If you bring a person who has a lot of sensitivity and intuition and openness, and you put them into situations in which there's all of this built in dysfunction that has to be processed, even just being in certain environments itself can be traumatizing to a person like that. They may be picking up on things going around them. It may not even look like that would be a traumatizing situation, but this is why it's important to keep in mind it's an individual experience. It's a subjective individual experience. Um, so one of the results of that trauma is it can be anxiety as well, which we'll be touching on. So. Right, and I think you bring up a very important point, and that is that it's subjective and it's individual, and that yes. two people can go through the same thing. And I hear it a lot. Well, you know, with siblings, well, it wasn't that bad. It wasn't that, you know, the parents weren't that abusive or this thing didn't happen or whatever. And they're like, and but we they lived through it together with totally different memory of it. Yes. And both people are right. Yeah. You yes. know, I think that that's an important point that you made because I yes. I've people like, well, what do you mean? It, it wasn't like that. Well, what do you mean? It was it was like that. Well, yes. It, yes. You're both right. Yes. Yes. And if you're a minority of some kind and uh, let's say just a a neurodiverse individual with a with an intensity and a sensitivity and a uh, maybe a giftedness as well in there a lot of things that that person may go through may not look like they could be traumatizing right and so it's really important to honor the individual and their experience and really understand the context of that person we have to enter into their lived experience to understand how they're going through the world and making sense of what has affected them and honoring their experience. Because one thing that I find in working with a lot of insensitive and intense people uh, is that they have chosen 
you know, it's better off that I kind of jettison my sensitivity or try to act a certain way or try to put on like a bit of a false self or a persona because the world is just, it's too overwhelming. And some of us lose touch with our actual experiences of what happens, which is also a kind of a trauma of, of sorts. So I often find in working with clients, it's, it's tuning into that individual, making them feel safe, making them feel seen and heard. And oftentimes things will come up, memories, emotions, experiences, nervous system, uh, things that they never even knew existed inside of them. Right. Or I've, I've had people and you probably have too that remembered it, but didn't think it was a big deal. And then when they touch oh, on yes. the ocean around it, they're like, Whoa, that was a big, bigger deal than I mentally yes. thought. Yes. And, and when you have a large brain or a very fast brain, sometimes we're really good at rationalizing things. That's another phenomenon I noticed in myself, but also in a lot of my clients is we're really good at kind of, maybe understanding something conceptually, but also kind of finding ways to justify or rationalize why something's not a big deal. <laughs> exactly. That's no big deal. It's, it's, it's incredible. And then, and then you start exploring a little bit and developing that, that trust, which, uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of people in these populations trusting, you know, health professionals is, is not an easy thing because they've been misunderstood and, and been traumatized even in those relationships. And you start kind of like uh, what I often experience with people is, uh, what I kind of conceptualize as like an inner child and the adult self, I can sometimes feel, and this is part of my own kind of sensitivity, that their inner child is actually locked away or terrified or uh, scared. And yet the rational kind of brain or what they're communicating seems to be like completely separate from that that more visceral emotional experience. And so I see kind of healing from trauma and we'll, and we'll get into that as well. It's kind of a bringing together of those parts an integration of kind of our rational mind, our nervous system and our bodies, our emotions, our inner child, our adult self. All coming together. So I always yes. tell everybody that the answer is not in figuring that if we could have figured it out, we already would have. Um, Absolutely. And yes. so let's talk a little bit about, the solution and like what are things we do like okay so we're gifted we're insensitive we have all these things i feel yeah. stuff that every, everybody else is feeling i can walk outside and tell you what's going on at the time and it's yeah. exhausting at times and exhilarating at other times and we have these ups and downs all these things yeah. and so if we were going to kind of um open some doors for some people about how to look at bringing all these pieces together. I kind of see it like a mosaic, like it all get, the, the tile gets smashed and now we're putting it all back together. Beautiful. Yeah. And it can be very beautiful, and right? Even beautiful. though it's it's sometimes imperfect, it's, let's say. Sometimes yeah. it's more beautiful. Sometimes, sometimes well, it, it's always more beautiful. Let's be it, honest, comes but, out, it comes out like just, yeah. you know, um, so, okay. So now everything's all broken up and we're feeling all goofy. And we both know that words alone and cognition alone don't, don't cut the mustard. They help, yes. but they don't cut the mustard. So what are some things that are forefront for you that you see as effective avenues for people to explore to really help rectify or heal this separation so that they can feel whole again? That's a, that's a very good question. And, and there's a lot of different kind of approaches one might take, right? There's, uh, and I'll start with some of the more kind of conventional psychological approaches, which can be very effective for people. So in, psych in psychotherapy, we often talk about like a top-down approach. So that's starting with the cognition or the thinking and then kind of making sense of things. But for trauma, often you also need a bottom-up approach. And that's starting with the body, with the nervous system. And that's that's getting away from some of the stories that we're telling ourselves. Uh, and again, as like with intense and, and very intelligent people, sometimes we just we get so attached to stories uh, that we're kind of just lose track of our visceral experience. So if you think about working with a person and helping them learn to inhabit their body, help, helping them learn to inhabit places in their body that feel safe helping them learn to to feel comfortable and even realize what they're experiencing in their body because a lot of people tend tend to kind of live in their heads and even outside of their bodies at times so there's kind of bringing things down and in um, and so there's certain treatments like you may have heard of emdr or brain spotting these ways of kind of getting kind of integrating the nervous system with uh, with the rest of the brain um, 
in my kind of, in my practice, the way that I often work with people, the first core ingredient is as a therapist, what am I bringing to the relationship? So obviously I'm human, we're imperfect creatures, but am I centered and grounded? And so if I can center and ground myself and feel relatively whole, uh, imperfectly whole, I can then provide a bit of a mirror for the person that I'm with. Right. And so they may notice something in me. It's, it, it may not even be like a conscious thing, but it's kind of like the energy that I'm bringing kind of interacts with the energy that the client is bringing. And there's communication happening there. I'm showing them how what it's like to be in my body and in my nervous system. So there's like a co-regulation that can take place on a more like individual basis, like outside of therapy. Um, one thing that I'm finding to be quite powerful for myself and increasingly so for a lot of particularly highly sensitive, uh, intense and gifted folks is working with the energy. So we talk about the psychology, the brain, you know, the body, Well, we also have energy bodies. Uh, there's plenty of um, uh, traditions that kind of recognize this, also increasing research around it, but we have an aura. Right. We have an aura, so a bit of an energy that kind of extends outside of our body. And we also have chakras inside of our bodies, seven energy centers. And what happens oftentimes with trauma is that energy gets blocked. Chakras get damaged. Each chakra kind of represents different kind of capacities of being human. And when those things get blocked, the energy doesn't flow nice and cleanly. And so we could be absorbing something. It gets stuck. It triggers something in us and the energy can't flow. So doing energy work practices to clear the aura and to, and to center and kind of ground out energy inside of us, I find that to be powerfully transformative. It both kind of centers the nervous system and grounds things out, but it also promotes growth and healing. It's, it's really, I would say it almost sometimes seems a little bit magical and magic being things that outside of conventional kind of Western scientific ways of looking at things, it doesn't make sense. But it's not really magical. It's actually just another way of experiencing the world that for the vast majority of human history, this is how we understood what it meant to be whole. Right. And, and we could heal ourselves. Oftentimes, Western medicine has been wonderful in some ways. It's also been horrible. So redeveloping that capacity for maintaining wholeness in oneself. And those are skills that we can learn and develop in therapy, but also just on our own. Because right, there's so many increasing resources out there, and I and I kind of like to look at things in a blended way. You know that the answer is yes. If some of these things have been around for thousands of years, there's validity to them, and sure. and so just allowing curiosity to check out <laughs> things. I mean, I have a client recently who just gave herself permission to check out information on chakras, and by the next meeting, she had like incorporated so much into her just daily physical exercise and everything, and her transformation is pumping along because yes. she allowed her curiosity to kind of follow down some roads. And then I added yes. some things. Well, check out this or look at that. And, and uh, we kind of blended things together. And just the other day, she's like, Whoa, she goes, this is like totally different. And it's only been like three months. I'm like, well, yeah. well, it's because I give you a ton of credit for being curious, going after it, saying yes to things that weren't typically in your field of view yet, but that you welcomed in to give it a shot. Mm -hmm. and, and I think mm -hmm. that's amazing, you know, and, um, and she comes from sure. a traditional background. And so it was, it was very, yes. it was very fun. Was yeah. Fun. And, and just, yeah. And sorry to interrupt, Dan, but I, I feel like it's important to also say like, so my, my background is, is quite traditional. Like, and I've had a, I've wrestled with my cerebral cortex over, over like even, even kind of accepting that these kind of more esoteric ways of understanding things could be real. Like my background's in science. I, I have a PhD, like I, I've done the kind of academic thing. And what I realized is like, what I was actually searching for is right here. <laughs> it's right here all the time in front of us. And I kind of had this a bit of an awakening of like, yeah, the, you know, studying things and, and using the mind, the left brain to kind of explore, but, but using the right brain to kind of just experience and be open to things. Right. And like you mentioned, being curious, curious, being curious is medicine. Yes. Being curious is a bit. So everything, everything can be a form of, of, of healing in a lot of ways. So the relationship between two different people, the way that we're the stories that we're telling ourselves, doing more conventional psychotherapeutic treatment, going out into nature and just experiencing our senses. There's so many things that we we have access that most of us have access to that could be enriching to ourselves and healing to ourselves. 
Right. And we both spend a lot of time in nature. And and I think that. Well, oh, I don't know what you're talking about, Dan. Uh, yeah, yeah, of course. Yes. 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 Every, every day I look for your cool yeah. nature picture. Yes. Like yes. every day I look for it. And if I don't see it, I have to go looking. Like I know there's one. I know there's one here. <laughs> and, and I yes. love it because. I, and I mm-hmm. put a lot of them up too, but I love yours because I love your energy and I like and what you stand for. And when I oh, feel the energy of the photo that you're seeing, my sensitivity can like just jump into the photo with you uh, yes. and yeah. feel it. And so it's kind of like I get to receive the the beauty and power of whatever nature shot you're taking. Oh, that's that's amazing distances away right mm-hmm. and there's there's power in understanding that our mm-hmm. energy and our connection like einstein said everything's connected to everything everything is yes and so if everything's connected to everything and like we're connected then when you do or say something that resonates with me then yes. that also benefits me yes yes and i think when we pay attention on that level and let our curiosity kind of lead, we can experience healing and rectifying things that does feel magical. It feels like it's magic when it's really just being totally aligned with the higher law yes. in a way yeah. that there's no words to describe. Exactly. Yeah. And I think the word alignment or the word connection, the word integration, and a lot of us have had these little experiences at time to time, but but it's something that's always accessible to us. Maybe well, that's a little bit idealistic because I think when we're intensely sensitive uh, creatures, if we're in environments that are, um, yeah, I want to be careful. Adjective I use here. I was going to say toxic, but uh, I mean it, it could feel toxic. It doesn't necessarily mean it's like a toxic environment. Um, I use the word tricky. <laughs> sometimes it can be very difficult. Yeah, so tricky environments. And I find a lot of environments to be quite tricky because I pick up on so much uh, that's going on around me. So I sense people's energy. Uh, I can sense the the energy of of, of natural elements. Uh, I can sense the energy of certain places and, and maybe things that have happened there historically. And so I have all of this kind of information that's coming at me all of the time. Um, most people, I think, uh, from from my understanding, are kind of oblivious to a lot of these things. But for me, it's like a real visceral experience. But nobody showed me that those things are kind of like part of being me. So from a young age, I kind of just uh, I I would have these experiences of, of of spirits, and like my grandfather came to me, and uh, I was walking in the field and, at uh, at my grade school, and the sun was shining down, and my grandfather peeked out of the sky and said, "I'm really proud of you. Keep up the great work." And I was like, okay, well, like, what do I do with that? Right. And I grew up in kind of a Christian ecosystem in which that type of thing is seen as like uh, a bit dangerous and, and witchcrafty or something like uh, speaking with, uh, with spirits. And so there's kind of been a rehabilitation for me of kind of reclaiming my experience in the world. And, and what I find with a lot of the people I work with is reclaiming all of who they are is itself therapeutic in healing. I remember uh, a client that I worked with who was a, a highly, exceptionally gifted uh, young person uh, in their 20s. And just having an experience sitting with me and kind of reflecting back kind of what it's like to be a, a gifted person and, and what the world feels like, he came away from that, that, that first kind of encounter just completely feeling like on a, on a cloud, on a bliss state, because it's like, okay, so my experience is legitimate. Yes. Yep. And yeah. sometimes that's the greatest service people like you and I do for somebody is to say, yes, it's real. What's happening is real. It is legitimate. You're perfectly okay. There's nothing wrong with you. Yes. Yeah. And I think the things that we often think are causing change, and this is this is our fancy little brain here, is we're always looking for cause and effect, right? And things don't actually work cause and effect. Like, I mean, they do at a certain level. Things are very non-linear linear and chaotic and everything's kind of interconnected. So what's happening between two people when they're having a conversation and, and there's 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 good feelings that are that are coming about and people come away feeling refreshed. Well, what is that? Well, I could say it's this, that, and that. Well, it could be another thing too. And that's okay with me. I don't I don't need to have the answers as to why, as to in some ways that's what makes life interesting, quite frankly. 
Right, exactly. And so what two people can be talking like you and I are talking and we can think we're having the same conversation or the same experience and we're not. No, exactly. <laughs> to me, exactly. that's fun. To me, that's fun. But sometimes some people might not understand that that's part of the beauty of life and the mystery of it and the excitement of it and the thrill of it. Uh-huh. Yes. And what that immediately brought up for me, Diane, is, is I think in our culture and for a lot of uh, a lot of people, uh, and again, I want to be careful with language a little bit here in terms of like grouping people, but people who are more neurotypical might find kind of surrendering their individuality to group experience and kind of losing their sense of to be a very like a powerful thing. What I find for a lot of neurodiverse people is that like they're so unique and individual that if they start cutting off pieces of themselves to become part of the group, they're losing core essences of who they are. And so that's not to say that we don't need relationship, but we need relationship and alignment with ourselves. And we need the interpersonal relationship on the horizontal plane with each other. But first and foremost, there needs to be a bit of a centeredness and groundedness in ourselves and a centeredness in our soul. And you know, one aspect of, of what can happen with trauma and what can and what can contribute to anxiety is being disconnected from our soul. And what I mean by soul is that deep, deep aspect of ourselves. It kind of in some ways resides in like a, another kind of domain. It resides in another area. And it, it has intentions for us in this world. It has intentions that, that want to be expressed through us, that want to be expressed through my body, through my ego. Um, and when we're not rooted in that, and many people, uh, from my understanding, from what I've experienced, aren't rooted in that. I wasn't for much of my life. There's kind of like this more existential disease, as in something's missing here. Like everything looks right, everything seems to be right, but there's something deep missing. There's something. There's something like it's like uh, yeah, it's like I'm not I'm not rooted. I'm not keyed into something that's that's providing me with a with a life force and energy. Um, and in my work with clients, oftentimes I kind of see that element in them and, and then we kind of explore it and, and reconnect to that, to that deep place. Yeah. That's a beautiful way of saying that. Cause I, I, I experience it kind of like, I use the word essence a lot, you know, is that deep and it's, and it's always inviting us to be express whatever the it is. And that's part of the mystery and beauty of life, but it's also part of where our power lies, right. And to say yes and follow yes. And, yeah. and I think that's part of the big human lesson. And with us neurodivergent type people that have all these different sensitivities and we're intense and all these things, I think somehow when we come to grips with that, who we are and we own it, right. And we get aligned in a way, it's a little easier for us to go find that essence and let it show up than somebody who's disconnected themselves and stays disconnected. And but still has that feeling trying to come out like that to me yeah. would create a lot of angst and probably anxiety and depression because you're running yeah. into the civil war, you know, like that essence is saying, Let, let's go, let's go, let's go. And and the ego and the rest of the fragment yep. is all, no, 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 let's go. No. And, it, and yes. it's back and forth. And mm -hmm. therein mm -hmm. lies depression, anxiety and a lot of things that people pathologize yes. when really it's an inner civil war. And if we yeah. would just put down the the weapons mm -hmm. <laughs> and 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 do a little bit of healing and loving and understanding and exploring, that mm -hmm. we would have a whole different life experience. Yes, yes, and I think even recognizing the civil war as not necessarily like a, a negative thing. It's like there's parts of ourselves that that have been put in service of defending the the fragmentation because. That fragmentation was adaptive at a certain point. It was adaptive and maybe in the classroom as a, as a gifted person kind of dealing with interpersonal kind of stressors or kind of, uh, I mean, we know, we all know of those dynamics that can happen. Um, oh, and I just completely, my brain just did a complete, uh, a complete fart. Can you bring me back, Diane? Exactly. Where was I? I was saying that, something. That some of the civil war. Oh, yes. Yes. Nature, it's not all yes. bad. Yes. Awesome. So it reminds me of, uh, of the story that I often use, uh, when I'm working with people, have you heard of the story of the loyal soldier? Yes. yes okay. So I'll just tell the story quickly. So, uh, it's, it's partially kind of true. It's partially somewhat mythologized. It, I mean, quite frankly, it doesn't really matter. So post-World War II, um, 
you know, the, 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 you know, the treaties had been signed, but scattered through islands in Southeast Asia were a lot of soldiers. And some of those soldiers were Japanese soldiers. And uh, their stories of soldiers thinking the war was continuing on for years, actually. They weren't discovered for years and they were still fighting for their country, thinking we're defending, we're fighting for our country, we're doing the right thing. What they didn't realize is guess what? The war's over. So those soldiers, uh, and again, I don't know how how voracious this is from a factual account, were when they were discovered, they were welcomed home and celebrated. They were celebrated as in, thank you for being honorable and fighting for your country, but it's okay to be a civilian now. It's okay to, to put down your weapon and and come and be a civilian and use that energy and that in service of a uh, service of life, not defense, in service of growth, not defense. So Oftentimes, I'm kind of careful about uh, conceptualizing like um, those which which are easy to kind of like problematic and, and more just kind of welcome them and say, what are you what are you trying to accomplish? You're tr- OK, you're trying to protect. OK, but you know what? Like, you don't need to do that anymore. Like you can you can put your weapon down. You can take a deep breath and let's give each other a big hug. Mm-hmm. And uh, and, you know, welcome, welcome them home and, and they can become part of the family. In a sense. Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. And and mm. that those realizations and really coming home to all of that is to me just yes. where our freedom lies. It's like there's no word for how beautiful it feels. Yes. And yes. I want to I want to talk a little bit about um, the consequence of bullying. That uh, bullying uh, happens especially to diverse people all over the place, not just in the typical way we see. And so. Um, get, would you speak to that a little bit about your what you see in bullying with with gifted people and sensitive people, and and maybe also share some things that that you do to help welcome them home into their own body so that they can be safe again. Sure. I mean, I mean, bullying is com- uh, complicated. Uh, you know, in, in some ways, there can be like really explicit bullying that's that's happening to a person, but there can also be more subtle kind of bullying, right? It's those little messages that you don't belong, or that you're weird, or that uh, you're a brown noser, or like it's kind of these other, these little ways of othering you to try to take your power away and to put you down, right? Mm-hmm. It's it's um, and, and for a gifted person, it, it can come in so many different ways. And because oftentimes we're so aware and sensitive to everything around us, we might pick up on things which a person may not even be intentionally doing, but they're sending this message that there's something wrong with you or there's something kind of like aberrant about you and you don't really belong here. And when we're vulnerable as, as, as children, vulnerable as humans, quite frankly, and, and we're told we don't belong or we're shown we don't belong or we get the messages that we don't belong, that there's something wrong with us, that bully kind of our power gets sapped out of us. We, we feel we might go into a bit of a fight or flight state and kind of vigilant. It's like we're scared to go to school or we're scared to experience that again. Or we may go into a bit more of a shutdown and a depression as in like just like just giving up on life. Like I just can't do this. I, and that's a common thing with a lot of sensitive people. They just go into shutdown very quickly. Um, and so I, I, haven't, I haven't encountered a neurodiverse person who has not gone, gone through some form of bullying, whether again, explicit or just lived experience kind of absorbing things around them. And so how do we kind of, how do we heal from that? Well, if you think about bullying being kind of feeling like there's aspects of ourselves that are wrong and we can internalize those messages and then we can start kind of pushing little pieces of ourselves off, right? right? People often will either hold on to themselves and have a lot of trouble They might go into more of a fight or flight state, which can cause them a lot of trouble interpersonally, but they're holding on to themselves, but they're vigilant. Other people just kind of shut down and and push the part of themselves off and adapt to the environment. Both strategies are not ideal, really. It might be necessary in certain environments for certain types of people. So how do we heal from that? How do I, how do I kind of work with people? It's just being full, fully human with another person. Mm-hmm. And welcoming those tender parts home and and creating that safe place and that place of kind of openness and acceptance. Um, and and I guess my experience is like slowly those little parts start to come forward. Um, there's a client uh, that that I'm working with, and we we talk about these different parts of ourselves. and and one of the parts is is 
is little girl. She, she calls her little girl. Um, and little girl, I could sense little girl, very, very terrified and, and has been through so much. Um, and for the longest time, she didn't seem to really be present at all in, in consciousness for this person. But as our work together continued and there was trust and there was kind of a, a, a bonding that was happening, an attachment that was happening, little girl started to come out. And she started to kind of express things and have memories uh, from the past come up. And we could talk about those things together and we could kind of be with ourselves together. And just by doing that, healing happens. Healing happens. That is the healing, right? Is that the, is the healing. Is the connection not only within, with like in this case, little girl and the adult woman, but it's also, I'm getting goosebumps. It's also yeah. the connection of your, your soul, your spirit, your human with that person reflecting back. It's, it's both. Yes. That, that's where yes. that healing happens. It's like, whoa, I can finally relax now. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And I tend to be like in my practice and in, the, in my philosophy, I tend to be pretty skeptical of like interventions. Um, not to say like we don't use different methodologies and, and different ways of kind of working with people. But the second, and again, this is partially my bias. This is how I work. This is my experience and the way I need to be. It, it's different, I think, for other people. But when you start thinking of things as in what do I need to do to kind of cause this person to kind of be a certain way or what it becomes kind of like you start objectifying you start you you, you, you you're losing that connection that just visceral kind of in, in the body you know here and now connection and your brain's kind of going to kind of what can i do what can how do i solve this problem and, the, and i think when we start doing that we're forgetting that the healing is actually about connection. So if we're distancing ourselves and evaluating a person, even that can be a felt sense of disconnection for a person who's very sensitive. So I'm very, uh, I mean, imperfectly, but I often just try to kind of be there and be fully present to the in the moment experience. I try not to plan too much or try not to get too far ahead because the second I do that, I'm missing things that are happening right now. Mm. That's the power of presence. The power of presence. Yeah. Right. It, it, it is the ultimate gift that we can experience for ourselves and offer to other people. It is so powerful. Yes. yes. It is. It's very powerful. Yes. I love it. I love it. So let's talk a little bit yeah. about anxiety. Mm -hmm. And and what I what I would like like to hear from you about, about anxiety is. Um, I hear people throw that word around pathologizing any kind of um, energy, right? And it's not oh. all anxiety by a, a diagnostic standpoint. And you can have that kind of hyper energy and not be anxious. And so what are some ways that intensely sensitive people who can get escalated really easily because they feel in everything what are some really good coping strategies? What are some ways that somebody can say, okay, hold on a second here. I don't have to pathologize my entire life experience. There are other ways to handle it. And before we even started recording, we were talking about that in our own lives. So, you know, we do it ourselves, but what are some strategies that you think would be useful for some people just to give it a shot so they don't have to live anxious all the time? I mean, in, in some way, that's a difficult question to answer because the experience of anxiety or we're activating. I mean, is density anxiety? I mean, it depends on kind of like a sense that, that you look at things. There's a person's experience that intensity or arousal is going to be individual. And so the thing that may work them might be a very individual thing as well. Um, I can speak of some of the things that I kind of do with clients. Um, and part of this reflects my nature. So I, you know, all of my, I've had the most amazing experiences uh, being in the natural, in the most kind of home sense, the most, because the energy in nature is coherent. It all, it, everything flows and everything ends. And nature just, just kind of want to take all of this, all of the crud that we pick up, all the crud that we pick up in our daily lives. And as, as intensely sensitive people, um, we're constantly picking things up. And we can hold on to those things without even realizing it. And this is more of like an energetic side of things. So often, uh, often kind of uh, 
I guess, prescribe for my clients just to go and spend time out in nature and see what happens. You don't have to have an agenda. I mean, that's not possible for everybody depending on their geographic situation, but sometimes the most profound things will happen just by being in the presence of this different type of energy. And I mean, I went for a bike ride this morning and uh, yesterday I had a bit of a anxious day. Um, my, my son uh, was having some difficulty with some sensory issues in his classroom. And at the same time he was having that, it turns out I was actually experiencing his, his feeling at the time and feeling very kind of uh, over, over aroused. And I couldn't really make sense of what was happening for me because it's like, it doesn't make any sense from a, a more linear perspective. So this morning I'm like, well, I have a bit of time. I need to go for a bike ride. So I need to get into my body. But getting into the body is so important. And I find physical exercise to be like one of the, just the best medicines. And then going out into the natural world, like every time I do, I come back with something, some type of a lesson, some type of an insight um, that I would have, I just, it just wouldn't have happened otherwise. Cause I'm, I'm choosing to kind of put myself in a situation where different kinds of communication is happening. Um, and one thing that happened to me in my bike ride this morning, which kind of just literally stopped me in my tracks is, is I was I was going to walk up this set of stairs to hit a trail that comes back to my house. And all, there was a skunk right under the stairs and it was looking at me. And I saw its tail start going up and I was like, holy shit, like uh, this thing's going to spray me. So I, I just, I stopped, I turned around, right? And I got this visceral sense, there's a lesson here. And, and then I did a little bit of research because I need my cerebral cortex does its, it does its thing. Oh, it turns out like it's when a skunk kind of uh, like literally comes into your life and, and stops you in your tracks like that. It's a, it's a sign that you need to also set some boundaries and kind of stand up for yourself, right? And stand up for your en energy and your power. And also you need to play. Skunks love to play. They're both this wonderful combination of boundaries and kind of like get the, get the heck away from me, but they also love to play. And so it was just a reminder of like, Oh, so after all of this intensity that happened yesterday, I think, you know, I think today I'm going to have to carve out some time to play. Yes, that's a great story. And it's so true, right? Like I, I had a weird, crazy, tricky day yesterday. It's the only word I can put to it. It was odd. And I'm like, okay, so this morning, first thing when I woke up and I still felt a little off, I'm like, all right. And I grabbed my dog and I said, come on. And we went, we went on walking, walking, walking. And of course I hung out with her while she sniffed. And then we walked some more and we just spent time in nature. And one of the things I love to do that gives my brain something to do while mm. I'm connecting with nature is look for yes. flowers. Uh -huh. I'm looking for little flowers. And like, if it's a little flower in the sidewalk or the other day, there was a huge gardenia bush and they're not blooming at this time, but there was this one isolated white bloom right in the middle of the flower and it called me. So oh, I took a picture of it. And, and that smell, that gardenia. Uh, oh my gosh. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I allow myself to just like connect with the flowers because that gives my brain something to do. So the rest of me yeah. just receive the beautiful energy of the natural world, wherever I am. And I find that that helps that that angsty feeling just kind of settle in so I can like be in my body. I even find myself yes. like my shoulders and like changing my posture over time. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Well, and I think you're raising a really important point there, Diane, for people who have, uh, and again, using all these different adjectives, but like a very active brain, let's just say, sometimes if we don't have enough input, our brain can kind of chew on itself and actually create kind of anxiety and create kind of, and so sometimes we actually need to, uh, and this is something I've experienced many times and I've heard from a lot of other gifted folks is like a lot of conventional kind of meditation can be very challenging because there's it's almost like you need enough input in order to relax, if that makes sense. Yes. And so off. So. So, yeah, maybe a moving meditation or an exercise meditation or when I'm doing meditation, I do more of like an energy work meditation where I'm imagining things and I'm, I'm working with because it gives my attention, my brain something to focus on while I'm present to my body. I find that's often a very hard thing to do when you have a very active, uh, an active brain. It, like it almost needs a certain amount of input in order not to self-destruct, quite frankly. Right. And that's what I've and learned for myself over time. And, and I teach it to a lot of my people go, I just can't meditate. I can't meditate. So we'll give your brain this one thing to think about or look for. Yes. Like one of my favorite exercises to do is to go out at dusk or dawn and say, how many different shades of green do you see over five minutes? Uh -huh. And so as the sun is moving, all those shades are changing. So the brain always is counting, which gives us then permission to actually come into our body and, and yes. identify things and kind of like 
align and heal because the brain's busy with yeah. something that's inconsequential in the real world, yeah. yet it gives it something to do. Yes. And, and I yes. find that that really helps, um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know, with some, because I think the idea sometimes for um, highly active brain people to say, empty your mind. It's, it's like, that's it. That's impossible. Right. That's it's impossible. I can't do that. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and then they want to do that. And then they throw it all out and, and, and suffer. Yeah. Yes. Or they say, I can't do this. So there's something wrong with me. Right. And it's like, no, there's something wrong with you. It's just, it's just your brain and nervous system are just different. So find what works for you right. and we'll work on that together. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So I only have a, one more thing I want to talk about because I could talk uh-huh. about days, as we all know, and yeah. but I want to be very aware of your time and and, oh, and respectful of it. And I'm so grateful that you're spending this time with us. So don't forget, everybody, Eric's bio and all his links are in the show notes for you. You've um, and I'll also put a link to his previous interview because there's a lot of wisdom in the things that we talk about and that Eric shares. And so I'll give yourself permission to kind of listen to it and digest it and listen to it again. And give yourself permission to just see the world in an expanded way. And you will be very happy you did that. Um, so now what I what I would the last thing I really want to talk about a little bit here is the sense of um sovereignty and standing uh, in our our essence, taking up uh, the rightful uh, amount of space in the world, not too much, not too little, and mm-hmm. giving ourselves permission to be here. Yes. And, and what, I, what I would like you to share a little bit about is where that kind of fits in your world and some things that you personally do to stand in your sovereignty as a man, mm-hmm. as a father of gifted children, as a therapist, mm-hmm. like you have lots of roles. And so how do you do it? You know, what? Yes. Yes, yes. I mean, that's a very good question. Like, how do I do that? Like, um, I, I have to like trans, I have to translate languages here in, in some ways from kind of the more open kind of into it. Like I kind of live in an intuitive soup a little bit. So to translate it into a more linear kind of language based thing can be quite challenging. Um, so let me see if I can do that. Um, it goes back for me. It goes back to that idea of being rooted in our soul. So I'm going to borrow some language from uh, the shamanistic uh, kind of uh, um, tradition to kind of explain this a little bit, to talk about so sovereignty and essence and, and personal power. Well, shamans talk about kind of two things that can lead to a lot of problems with us. First thing is soul loss. And soul loss is like when a a big part of ourselves, like a a core part has to go, has to go into hiding or gets locked away or kind of gets, um, gets put into a different, uh, a different realm. Uh, And that's because of trauma, right? Oftentimes trauma leads to that. So, um, and then the second thing is power loss and power loss is, it's a little bit like say less severe than soul loss. It's not like a big chunk of yourself has, has gone away. It's more like, you're not, um, things aren't flowing very well. And so, so the, the treatment for both of those things is to reconnect with one soul. So to find out what is true for you, find out your values, your meaning, your purpose, find out where you feel called to in the world. Um, and one of my favorite, uh, theologians, Frederick Buchner, who just passed away actually, uh, earlier in the summer. Uh, and I'm probably going to, uh, I'm going to kind of uh, butcher his statement here, but he he talks about your, your place in the world is where your great joy and the world's great need overlap. So you're here to be of service in some way. That's what the soul is here to do is to be of service and to help, to help others. So discovering kind of what brings you alive, which increases your vitality, increases your energy and also where there's a need. Like that is the sweet spot for each of us. And that's going to be distinct for each of us. It's a unique thing. So if you look at the natural world, you have different types of trees, you have different types of species. Each one is unique, but each, each species, each tree offers something to the collective by standing rooted in its essence. Right. And then in terms of once you've kind of discovered that, well, that's, that's great. Like that's, that's really helpful. But 
when you're when you're intensely sensitive or you have a, a nervous system that's that's easily kind of aroused or can go into shutdown there has to be like an ongoing maintenance and for me it's doing energy work practices and i'm actually um, co-authoring a book on integrating energy work into psychotherapy because both ways of looking at things have important insights for different types of people and bringing that wholeness together i see as, as very important um and i i do things like i go on shamanic journeys so i I listen to drumming and I kind of, uh, I go off in, in space and time and I have these kind of what could be de determined to be kind of imaginative experience. It depends on one's worldview. And I come away from those experiences with lessons and insights and sense of well-being. I go out into nature on a daily basis, partly because I love to, because I have to. It's home to me. That is where to keep on going back to in a disciplined way, but also in a loving way. Um, because that's where a lot of this that I pick, I can get cleared up, replenished. Mm -hmm. So those are some of the things that I do maintain sovereignty. Practically speaking, I have the, I'll say the privilege in, in some ways, I've worked very, but not everybody can always do this, but I'm self-employed. I have my own environment. I'm able to control to the most extent. And for me, very important. Because if I am put into the wrong environment or put into an environment that's tricky and I have to deal with that all of the time, no matter what I do to kind of regulate myself or to kind of, it, it, it's taxing on my system. And so I've created habitat for myself where uh, things are calm. I've, I've, I have a place that's calm. I have plants all around me. I have natural light. And just being around these kind of like the sensorial experience of just calmness and beauty Oh, brings me down, brings me back into my essence, into my power. So, oh, yes, yeah. that's beautiful. So the lesson I think for all of us is <sighs> take a moment and just get within and really develop our inner connection. And then also to say, okay, how can I create an environment for myself that supports that? Yes whether it's plants or natural light or like I have to have calm as well around me and, and regular contact with the nature. And, um, and I have to have a balance of some water and some trees. Uh -huh. It used to be mostly, used to be mostly and only water. And in the last few years, the trees started showing up, go be with the trees. So then I moved from Florida to North Carolina so I can be with water and trees. And I'm finding that's really even more fulfilling at this yes. stage, you know, of my world. Yes. And I think that it's so important that we do that, that we honor our stages. And as we grow and change, our, our connection's going to evolve with us. Mm -hmm. So what may not fit today may fit tomorrow. And what fits perfectly today may not fit a year from now. And it's all okay. Yes. It's all okay. Yes. Yeah. And, and again, like if we look to the natural world, growth is constant right? Growth, there's cycles, there's rhythms, but there's, there's always change happening. And the thing about being human, perhaps this is an evolutionary flaw. I mean, who, who knows how to conceptualize this? My brain likes to think about these things and come up with theories and stuff, but we're the one species that doesn't know often what we actually need or who we actually are. Right. And so we have to be reminded of who we are and what we are. And we have to discover who we are and what we are. And that's really what education should be uh, in, in, in my, uh, I guess, in my bias. No, actually, I think it's just truth, quite frankly. But right. to discover what is unique about us. And then we care for that plant, right? We care for that plant. We create environments that are healthy. We do things to care for ourselves, okay? Then we can offer that gift to others, right? There, there, there is always that kind of giving, and taking there's always a give and a take there's always an in and an out right and if you're just focused totally just on uh on yourself and sometimes we need to be right if, if we're going through a lot we need to really focus on ourselves and, and really cherish that but there it will inevitably come a point where there's an opportunity to give that back and to offer it to somebody else and that is where i think a lot of the magic happens because we're all interconnected and when we care for ourselves we're caring for everybody else when we care for other people we're caring for ourselves right that's beautiful well i want to thank you for being on the show today and thank you for sharing your wisdom and your presence and thank you for blessing my life well th thank you very much dan it's it's been uh i was going to say it's been a pleasure but that sounds kind of trite 
Uh, it's been an experience to, to talk with you and a good experience, quite frankly. And thank you for what you're doing in the world as well. Well, thank you. So remember, everybody, put your face to the sun so those shadows fall behind you because you're a rock star and you're here on purpose with a purpose. But let the purpose show up and shine. Stand in who you are and be that amazing self that you came here to be. Until the next episode of Someone Gets Me, be well.